So first I'd like to ask everybody to stand, stretch, breathe, inhale, I didn't say what to inhale, and exhale, and just relax a little bit. This is going to be a, a different type of talk. I'm going to get into some science, but this is mostly going to be about clinical work so, that we've been doing. All right, so this is, uh, this is us. We're Hollis Health. We're located in Boulder in Denver. I'm the least traveled uh, person to speak today because I live here in Broomfield. It took me 10 minutes drive in my electric leaf to get here, which is run off my sun-powered roof. So I think more of us need to do that because we have generations behind us who need our help. I have grandbabies. Uh, this is our group of practitioners who practice at, at Holos Health. We're Holos Health, we're also Journey to Life. Journey to Life, just so you know, I got into this uh, after I got back from uh, New Zealand practicing medicine. And I have to say, I know we heard earlier uh, from an earlier speaker about uh, socialized medicine. Well, I got to practice in a socialized medicine environment for two and a half years. And I have to tell you, as an obstetrician gynecologist, the outcomes are far better than what we see in this country. So don't throw any tomatoes at me. Um, so Dr. Rattel is here today. She does our, you want to stand up Lisa for a sec? Dr. Rattel does our uh, uh, evaluations, especially uh, specialized in, in our children who have seizures. And she's been getting remarkable results with those kids. Dr. Dave Gordon uh, does internal medicine and functional medicine. Functional medicine is my area, which is all about nutrition, lifestyle, supplementation, removing triggers of disease, and helping people get healthy and stay healthy, and eliminate uh, the possibility of disease as much as possible. Sarah Cohen is, is uh, internal medicine, and she does plant medicine as well. And then we have three nurses on staff who have a call center, because what's happening now is that patients will go to a dispensary and rely on a 21-year-old who has no medical knowledge behind the counter to be able to get their cannabis medicine, and then they end up in the emergency room with all kinds of problems because they got bad advice. So our nursing center is there to make sure that people know how to use this medicine responsibly. Learning objectives uh, for today are gonna be the basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system, um, the yin and yang of THC and CBD, how they work together, of uh, complement each other, uh, and how cannabis can use, be used to treat a wide variety of disorders. We're going to talk about methods of delivery, and we're also going to talk about uh, making appropriate recommendations to patients. Now, I'm a free agent, okay? Uh, you can read this on your own. I'm a free agent. I don't have hospital privileges any longer. I work, I did my 10,000 babies, I'm done. Uh, I worked as a solo obstetrician for 30 years. Uh, and uh, I would probably not be alive today had I still been doing that. I left New Zealand uh, about uh, nine years ago was when I started practicing, 10 years ago or so, is when I started practicing cannabis medicine. When I got back, I didn't want to practice obstetrics and gynecology. My wife brought me to a dispensary to help get medicine for her autoimmune disease. She has rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia. And I went with her, they said, do you want a job? I said, well, I just got back, I need something to do. I had no knowledge of cannabis other than when I used to take a trip to Jamaica back in the day. <laughs> or what I would say is that in medical school, we used to go in the backwoods and all a lot of docs back then were using cannabis this back in the 70s uh, when we were in medical school. So I'm sure a lot of people here have experienced it, but I'm, gonna ask, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands. So, uh, Cannabis medicine was new to me. And the way I learned was as a clinician. I'm not gonna be talking about studies. That's why I'm saying we're shifting gears. It's gonna be uh, fairly easy to understand. And uh, it's gonna be what I also talk to bud tenders because we train them on how to responsibly recommend this medicine. But this is our endocannabinoid system, vital to understanding how this medicine works. And I will tell you right now, cannabis is the most significant medicine I've ever worked with in my entire career. And there's a reason for that. It's because we're wired for this plant. So all animals have an endocannabinoid system. It started with C squirts back 600 million years ago. And through evolution, we all have the system in our body. And the reason that we have this system is for balance and homeostasis. So um, C 
600 million years ago, we developed the system from sea squirts on. Uh, the cannabis plant uh, with its phytocannabinoids came around about 150 million years ago. Uh, animals already had the system in their body, and then the plant came around with the exact same chemical structure of what animals were already producing. And that's why I say we're wired for this plant. We make two of our own cannabinoids. They're called an anamide 2-AG. There's more than that. These are the two primary that I'm mentioning today. And this wasn't discovered until 1990. So at the first slide I mentioned, uh, I had on there, this is what we didn't learn in medical school. Well, when I went to medical school back in the dark ages, uh, in the 70s, uh, basically we didn't know about an endocannabinoid system. We didn't learn about this until 25 years ago is when the discovery was made. So a lot of us in this room may not have been taught this, and unfortunately even people who are uh, just graduating medical school uh, with some rare exceptions, still are not learning about this system, and that's shameful, because it's one of the most significant systems in our body. And again, the purpose of the system is to provide balance and homeostasis. Uh, just to give you an example of that, when we're talking about our neurotransmitters, we're talking about our, our neurons and our synapse. Uh, all neurotransmitters is a one-way street, you go know, one direction. When you talk about cannabinoids, it creates, it doesn't actually work this way, but just to keep it simple, because uh, that's how my mind works. Uh, it, it actually goes retrograde through the synapse. So when you have a hyper system, it slows it down, and when you have a hypo system, it speeds it up. So again, it's for balance and homeostasis. We would not exist without the system in our body. And it's shameful that back in the 1930s and then in the, again in the 1960s when it became a Schedule One drug, Schedule One simply means it has no therapeutic value and is highly addictive. It's the complete opposite. It's rarely addictive and it has more therapeutic value than any other medicine I've ever seen, by far. Not prejudice by any way. Um, so this is the structure of uh, an anamide and 2-AG, uh, which is what we produce ourselves. They're produced uh, on demand and they're quickly gone. So we produce them when our body's out of balance and it tries to put everything into balance and then they dissipate very quickly. So we can use the plant medicine to help in, in certain situations. So basically we're talking about pre and postsynaptic uh, issues here. We have THC, we have CBD, we have CBN, we have, well, I, last I heard at the Medi uh, MJ for MD's conference in Denver, which was just a few weeks ago, uh, there are up to 166 now discovered endocannabinoids, or, or phytocannabinoids, I should say. But we know mostly about CBD and THC. CBD was actually bred out of the plants, and the reason it was bred out of the plants is because CBD doesn't get you high. As a matter of fact, more CBD you have relative to THC, the less psychoactivity you get. So when people are using it for psychoactivity, they bred the CBD out, and now we're breeding it back in because we realize that CBD is probably one of the most important uh, one of the most important parts of the plants, if not the most important part. CBD stands for cannabidiol, if you're wondering that. Uh, obviously, uh, we have receptors throughout our brain. As a matter of fact, our CB1 and CB2 receptors are what we produce. CB1 receptors are mostly found in the brain, but they're found in uh, other areas all throughout your body. And CB2 receptors are mostly found in, in your immune system and found in other areas of the body. But one thing that you're not going to see on the slide, uh, it, we do not have any cannabinoid receptors in the brainstem. So, when you're taking opioids, uh, alcohol, benzos, you're doing things that can actually stop you from breathing uh, or stop your heart rate from, be, uh, from beating, the reason that cannabis doesn't do that and the reason that it's non-toxic is because we do not have receptors in our brainstem. So again, I'm going to reiterate a few things here. Receptors are found throughout our body. CB1 receptors most concentrated in the brain. CB2 receptors in our immune system, but found in our peripheral nervous system and in a variety of areas in the body. It's a lock and a key, as uh, you know, I'm talking to a medical uh, group here, I'm not talking to butt tenders. So obviously we have our ligands and our receptors and our endocannabinoids and our phytocannabinoids are all the ligands that fit into the same receptors. 
And that's when I say we're wired for this plant. It's because the plant has the same chemical structure that fits into our receptors. And now we need to learn how to use it appropriately so you get the best results. And that will, we, that's what we've been working on over the last nine years in our practice. So activation of CB1 receptors is responsible for the psychoactive and physical effects commonly associated with cannabis consumptions, and that's going to be more of the THC effect you get. But CBD also has effects. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you right now, the best anti-anxiety anti drug on the man is CBD. And if you can get a fast-acting form of CBD, which uh, we have available nowadays, you can do a sublingual pump, and in five minutes your anxiety is, is uh, pretty much relieved. So uh, it does work in the brain as well. Um, CB2 receptors are, uh, are found in the immune system and control the release of cytokines that promote inflammation and immune function. And CBD tends to work really well for inflammation. As a matter of fact, CBD not only is an anti-anxiety drug, it is a great anti-inflammatory. So this is a very complex regulatory system with broad and diverse functions. And due to its ubiquitous activity, it provides us with a bridge between body and mind. Well, you think about that. Uh, just think about the psychoactivity of THC and what CBD can do with relieving anxiety. Well, we have this uh, HPA axis. So when, you're, uh, when you have cannabinoids, whether it be phyto or endo, uh, they actually will affect your adrenals, which are obviously your fight or flight organs. So you affect the adrenals, and things calm down. And this is why that connection and why this is a great body-mind uh, medicine. So again, it's, it's uh, still not taught in most medical schools, but that is changing very rapidly. Uh, actually, here in the US, we're behind the eight ball. Canada just legalized marijuana. They've had medical marijuana as well. Uh, and they're going to be far ahead of us in research. Israel, Spain, uh, other countries are doing a ton of research on cannabis medicine, and uh, we're a little bit behind the eight ball here, but I think we'll get there eventually. So again, this is our endocannabinoids and our phytocannabinoids, and they can control feeding, emotion, pain, memory, pleasure, and a whole host of other functions. All right, so this is um, a slide that's going to show you raw, heated, and aged cannabis. Now raw comes from the raw plant obviously and some people will actually juice the leaves and get THCA, the acid form, or CBDA, CBCA. Those are the acid forms of, of, uh, of cannabis. And cannabis is not just marijuana. I don't like to use that word. Uh, it has a derogatory tone to it. Uh, but the only time I use it is when we talk about hemp, which also you can get CBD from hemp which is pretty much legal. You buy it at a grocery store. We ship our hemp across state lines, uh, and nobody seems to mind uh, having hemp. Hemp simply means that it has less than, uh, or 0.3% THC or less. That's what makes a hemp. Same plant, different uh, grades of THC, basically. We have all the other com components to it. So THCA is the acid form. You have to decarboxylate it. And when you decarboxylate it, it turns into THC. And that's what hits you high. That's where you get the psychoactivity. And the same thing with CBD. You decarboxylate that, and you get all the effects of CBD, which is a very long list. That's why I say it's the most medicinal part of the plant without any psychoactivity uh, and can have a lot of positive benefits. When you get to aged cannabis, what I want to mention to you is, uh, is CBN. CBN is oxidized THC. If you had an old joint sitting around and you say, oh, let me, let me smoke this, you'll fall asleep. And the reason you'll fall asleep is because the THC has converted into CBN, and CBN is an excellent sleep medicine without the psychoactivity. We now have CBN, which can actually be created from hemp, which is available to people over the counter, whereas it used to be just from uh, marijuana. So these are some of the emerging, emerging clinical applications. So there's studies being done, like I said, all over the world. Uh, two countries that are kind of leading the way with studies right now are Spain and Israel. Um, there's a lot of information coming out. And in England, uh, in the UK, I should say, 
GW Pharmaceuticals uh, came out with a, so the studies have already been done on multiple sclerosis. Uh, they use a one-to-one -one ratio of CP to THC in a sublingual dose to treat MS, both in neurodegenerative and in autoimmune disease, and they've had remarkable results with that. We don't need GW Pharmaceuticals here in Colorado. We have growers, local people who make their own, and I really uh, love what they're doing uh, for our patients. So we don't have to have Big Pharma coming in and doing this for us. Although Epidiolex, which is made by GW Pharmaceutical, was just approved as a Schedule V drug. Uh, it's a CBD that's used for seizures. Well, as uh, Dr. Rattel can tell you, she's seen amazing results with these kids uh, using what we can get right here in Colorado for, for patients. And we see a lot of refugees coming in from all over the states to get this medicine here in Colorado for their kids. So you can see there's a whole lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to go through all these, all the different uh, disease. You can read that for yourself. But we're seeing uh, even more than this. This is just a partial list of what we're seeing. And if you think about the fact that we have an endocannabinoid system, and if you use this medicine appropriately, uh, you can do a lot to enhance your health and uh, stay off of other toxic medications, such as opioids, which we'll get into in a little bit. I thought I would give you a little positive on opioids at the end of the talk, because we're getting people off of their opioids every single day in our practice. And uh, Dr. Uh, Cohen, the other Dr. Cohen, no relation, Sarah, is, uh, is going to be taking that on as part of her practice in our Denver office. So I want to go through just the blue on this slide, which is uh, cannabidiol, CBD, and I'm going to run through this just briefly. It's an anti-anxiety drug, so we're starting on the left side. Antipsychotic, you know, you hear that, uh, that cannabis is a, uh, causes psychoses. Well, it can cause psychoses uh, when somebody's predisposed, if you get too much THC, but if you balance that out with CBD, you're not going to have that psychosis. So CBD is an antidote to a lot of the problems that THC may actually cause for some people. Anti-seizure, we went over that. Neuroprotective. This is a neuroprotective drug. It works in five ways. Number one, neuroprotection. Uh, it's it's uh, anti-inflammatory, and that includes neuroinflammation. It's an antioxidant. It creates neurogenesis, helps regrow new brain cells. And these studies have all been done. It's uh, basically, um, it prevents what's known as, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, glutamate excitotoxicity in the brain, which kills brain cells seen in all traumatic brain injuries, people weaning off of benzos, opioids, alcohol, uh, have an increase in glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter that kills brain cells. Cannabis prevents that from happening. Uh, and and I'll, I will state right now, we have uh, patients that we see who are ex-NFL players. We have one right now who used to play for the uh, Patriots as a free safety as well as New Orleans. Uh, and he is using CP and THC combined. Uh, he had all the symptoms we would associate with somebody who has chronic traumatic encephalopathy, even though you can't make the diagnosis until postmortem. We already know what the symptoms are. So we know he's had, as a free safety, he was banging his head all the time. Uh, first time I saw him uh, a few years ago, he came to the office. He couldn't remember more than five minutes. Uh, he said, I have to communicate with his wife uh, in, in the future to talk about anything because he won't remember anything. He'd been arrested, he'd been enraged, he's contemplated suicide, he had OCD, he had a lot of different symptoms that we see with uh, CTE patients. After um, they put him into an institution and they were zoning him out with all these antipsychotic drugs and whatever, he was just vegetating for several weeks. And his wife took him out, put him on a heavy duty nutritional program. We gave him some CBD, he used some THC as well. Uh, we saw him, um, I just saw him just a few months ago, and you would never know that he was the same person. He remarkably improved with his CTE symptoms. So it is neuroprotective. And the other, the fifth thing that I didn't mention is what we're doing some work with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, the, now these are my studies, and I know our brains are not mouse brains, some of us at least. Uh, but um, 
they have found that you can actually decrease the amyloid beta plaque uh, in the brain using cannabinoids. And that's not just CBD, it's also THC. But we recommend for our dementia patients, we recommend CBD because they don't need any help wondering why they went into a room. Uh, so CBD will be a lot better for our elders. And we see a lot of elders, the fastest growing demographic in our practice. It's a vasolactin, it can lower your blood pressure. It's, a, it's an anti-spasmodic, anti-ischemic. We talked about ischemia earlier. Anti-proliferative, anti-cancer. And this is a very controversial area, but we see patients who come in not just to treat symptoms that they're getting under uh, for chemo and radiation or surgery or from the cancer itself, but to actually use it as an adjunct therapy to actually uh, kill cancer cells because it works with apoptosis, it works with decreasing angiogenesis, and it also cuts, turns off a gene called a 91 gene, which promotes uh, metastasis. Uh, and we also, uh, it wasn't on our first uh, slide, but there is an a, a integrative cancer uh, physician who's joining our practice uh, next month, and he'll be uh, doing all the genetic studies and, and looking at uh, everything more thoroughly than what I can do, because I'm not a not an oncologist, far from it. Um, Anti-emetic, we all know that. Uh, that's also THC. Antibacterial, anti-diabetic. My dog, as an example, gets CBD twice a day, every day with his insulin. He's diabetic, obviously. Uh, it helps stabilize his blood sugars. And we know that with type 1 diabetics, type 2 diabetics is, is a 100% preventable disease and often reversible. Uh, and that's diet and exercise. Um, Anti-psoriatic, you now psoriasis is related to autoimmune, and uh, it's immunosuppressive. You'll see that down there at the bottom. Uh, and when, it, when we're talking about immunosuppressive, we're talking about people who may not need their biologic drugs, which lower your, your immune system below normal. CBD brings everything to normal. Remember, it's for balance and homeostasis, never below. If you have a hypo system, it brings it up. If you have a hyper system, it brings it down. Uh, and we use it for those uh, very, very successfully with our autoimmune patients, which is my area of interest now because my wife has two autoimmune diseases, uh, which she no longer has. Uh, her rheumatoid finger is completely reverted back to normal after two years of being gluten-free because gluten is at the trigger of uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, there's a whole other talk I could do on that, which I'm not going to get into today, uh, and then using uh, cannabinoids. And that's the functional medicine part of my practice. Um, so you can, you can go on, you see it's analgesic. It's a bone stimulant. We use it for our postmenopausal women to help uh, regrow bone. Um, and, uh, and we may also recommend hormone replacement therapy with bioidenticals, et cetera, but it is a bone stimulant. Um, so these are just some of the things that uh, we can see in anti-inflammatory I mentioned earlier. So this is an interesting slide. Cannabis has 20 times the anti-inflammatory power of aspirin and twice the anti-inflammatory power of uh, steroids. Steroids, as you well know, can be very dangerous drugs, uh, and, and cannabis can be used in its place in many situations. These are what we call terpenes, and you're not, you don't have to read this slide, but I'll, I'll just skip over it. But terpenes give flavor and odor to when you're if you were to smell cannabis, uh, and I'm sure many of us have, uh, you would smell the terpenes. The terpenes are there to protect the plant and do a whole lot of things, but they also modulate the effect of the cannabinoids. So you may have heard of indica strains and sativa strains. We don't like to use those terms much anymore because it's a mix of everything anymore. But indicas are supposedly your nighttime body relaxing sleep, uh, pain relieving strains. And sativas are more your daytime, awake, alert, creative strains. Well, you can have the exact same cannabinoid profile. The difference between the two are the terpenes, which modulate how the cannabinoids work in the body. And there are over 200 potential terpenes, uh, in, not in one plant. They usually have a few in one, a few uh, others in others, which will give you a, a completely different effect from the cannabinoids. And they modulate the effects of cannabinoids, which in turn modulate the effects of neurotransmitters. And they may be responsible for the different effects of cultivars, which I just met, uh, mentioned. And one of the terpenes called beta caryophylline uh, actually binds to uh, the CB2 receptors in the immune system and actually works similarly to a cannabinoid. 
CBD uh, indirectly uh, stimulates endogenous cannabinoid signaling by suppressing a fatty acid uh, uh, enzyme that we call FA. I'm just going to call it FA. Uh, amide hydroxylase is the, the long word there. So, and CBD, and this is not a question. <laughs> so, CBD, this is, uh, yeah, give me a little advance notice here. Uh, so, CBD stimulates the production of um, this fatty acid FA. Uh, it, and FA breaks down an, an anamide. So, therefore, CBD allows an anamide to remain longer, not stimulates the other way around. It allows an anamide to remain longer in your body. So it's actually helping your own cannabinoid and anandamide to work better by increasing what we call cannabinoid endocannabinoid tone. It also increases the production of 2-AG. So you decrease the destruction of anandamide, uh, destruction of anandamide, allowing it to function. You, de you increase the production of 2-AG with CBD. And that's endocannabinoid tone is the word we like to use uh, for that. So, Ethan Russo, a neurologist who worked, uh, he was a medical uh, uh, person for GW Pharmaceuticals, he's a neurologist, he's done all kinds of studies, he's one of the most famous names in uh, cannabis research in the world, uh, and he came up with the theory about endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. I was a skeptic. I didn't really think that endocannabinoid uh, deficiency syndrome existed. However, one of the uh, statements that he made is that he believes that some of us with migraines may have an endocannabinoid deficiency. Well, I was getting migraines twice a week, and this has been going on for as long as I can remember. As soon as, as soon as, I'm talking about as soon as, the day of, using CBD twice a day, my migraines completely went away, gone, and that was for a long, long period of time. So realize that there may be some validity to some of these studies. This isn't, this isn't snake oil. It, uh, once you start learning about how it works in the body, you'll realize that this is a pretty significant uh, medicine that we have available to us. THCA, this is the acid form of THC. It's non-psychoactive. People get THCA here in Colorado at a dispensary. THCA, again, non-psychoactive, you keep it in the fridge. The reason you do that is because it can, uh, it can uh, decarboxylate into THC, and if it's not refrigerated, heat, uh, exposure to heat will convert it over and then you'll get high. So people are using uh, THCA, we recommend they keep it refrigerated. But it has anti-inflammatory effects and does a whole lot of other things. It also has anti-cancer properties as well. And it may actually not bind to receptor, but may decrease the destruction of 2-AG. So CBD may increase the production of 2-AG. CBD, uh, THCA rather, may decrease the destruction of, of um, 2-AG. And then you have an anamide also decreasing the structure from CBD. Um, you can juice the leaves. It takes a lot of plant material to do that, to get your THCA. Uh, so most people don't have access to, to that much cannabis material. Uh, so uh, you can get it in a tincture form already produced and sold at dispensaries. Again, non-psychoactive. Methods of use. Just check my time here. Looks like I'm okay for Yeah, good. Okay. So uh, topical marijuana, I want to talk about that. Uh, it's, uh, you're not going to get stone from topical marijuana. Uh, unless you're having a whole body massage, okay? And you can do that if you like. They even have bath bombs you can put in uh, into, your, uh, into your bathtub and, and just get totally relaxed. You know, be careful with that though. Smoking a joint or using anything in a hot tub or a bathtub, it lowers your blood pressure. You can have orthostatic hypotension getting out of the tub that lowers your pressure from the hot water. The two combine because you pass out, hit your head, and drown. So you've got to be careful about how you use it. But there are bath bombs that are available. Um, you want to massage it uh, into the affected area. Say you're having neck spasms or back spasms or whatever joint pain. You can get topical marijuana massage into the area. Anytime anybody has spasm, I usually recommend massaging in 
combination of CBD and THC. There's a whole variety of them out there. Massage into the neck, put a neck warmer over it, and watch what happens. Uh, it can cause significant relief without any psychoactivity. Um, and they're often combined with uh, other compounds. Uh, there's a variety of compounds they'll put that are in, you know, whether it be arnica or whatever there may be, that they will combine with cannabinoids in the medicine. It also, they did a study at the University of Colorado with the dermatologists and found it was the most effective treatment for uh, different types of skin conditions, whether it be eczema, psoriasis, and a variety of uh, conditions that people uh, will see. Again, I, I have to reiterate, this is an adjunct therapy. It's a great treatment, but if you're not doing the nutritional things you need to do and you're not changing your lifestyle, you're not going to go anywhere. You will treat your symptoms like you would with any other medication, but you've got to get to the root cause of disease. Eliminate the triggers, and that's the functional medicine part. Inhalation. This is the method that most of us are aware of uh, from the past. Uh, inhaling is immediate. It's, uh, it acts almost immediately. Uh, it peaks in about 10 minutes. It lasts about two hours. So it's fast acting and short acting. And that's an advantage. Uh, an example would be if you're feeling you have to go to work, but you get up early uh, and say you want to work out, you want to get into your workout, whatever you're doing, uh, and really focus, you can inhale, you can get rid of your pain, you can um, do a lot of things to enhance your workout. And by the time you go to work, if you get up early enough, if you're inhaling, it's gone. So you're able to get in the car and drive. That's an example of where inhalation can come in handy because it is short acting and it works immediately. Uh, there's pipes, there's bombs, there's you know uh, joints, whatever. We don't recommend that. Uh, because there's carcinogens, smoke, odor, cough, congestion, sinus problems, carbon dioxide, butane inhalation, all the negatives go with smoking, but when you vaporize the bud or the flower, I'm not talking about concentrates here, we're talking about grinding bud, putting in a vaporizer and inhaling, you're eliminating all the negatives. You're not getting the carcinogens or all the other problems that you have, and there's hardly any odor to it. You don't get the congestion or anything else. You have the ability to set the temperature so it's comfortable for you, uh, and you have every cultivar or strain available in flower, which is a huge advantage. They're going to come in uh, plug-in or portable models. So that's my preferred method of uh, inhaling. These are vape pens. Uh, that's not recommended as our first line of treatment because the concentrates, uh, you, you get a preloaded cartridge, uh, sometimes they put chemicals in that cartridge like propylene glycol, which is not healthy for us. Uh, they're, they may take out when they're extracting, uh, making these cartridges, they actually may be taking out the terpenes and other really vital parts of the plant. It's what we call the entourage effect. You need the whole plant with all of its parts. We think we're a lot smarter than this plant, so everybody's trying to do this and that and break it down and add things back. We co-evolved with this plant. People, humans have been using this plant for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and so we co-evolved with it. So there's an intelligence to this plant that combines with us as humans that work very well together because we co-evolved. So we start playing around with it. We're actually doing more harm than good sometimes. And I, I'm not a real proponent of concentrates that do work for people. I do think it has its place for sure. But uh, we have to be careful because we build up a higher tolerance, which is often unnecessary. They also have poor temperature control. Uh, they concentrate any pesticides or fungicides that we use in the grow. Hopefully there weren't any, but many of them do have. Uh, and like I said, increased potential for uh, tolerance issues. Definitely not recommended for new users. New users should be using something more gentle, whether it be inhalation or but not this. Let's talk about this real briefly. So this is, these are the patients who are abusing cannabis, They're doing what's called dabbing. They buy this rig. They use a butane torch. They find the strongest form of cannabis that they can find, uh, and they'll breathe this stuff in. And we call it the crack cocaine of cannabis because it looks like you're doing crack. And the problem is when they're doing this, they're getting closer to 90% THC. If you're smoking a joint, as an example, you're probably getting more like 15% THC. So you get multiple times 
of, of uh, THC, if you're using THC in your dabs. And what that does, uh, it actually causes our receptors to go into hiding. The reason that happens is very simple. We have this endocannabinoid system, and the purpose is to keep everything in balance. Well, how do you keep it in balance when you're getting way too many cannabinoids in? You can't, except you do. And the reason you do that is because your receptors no longer respond. So you have to be very careful how you use this. You want to use it effectively so that it's enhancing your health, not causing you to overuse. And this is when we see addiction. This is when we see both psychological dependency and withdrawal symptoms very often with dab, uh, people who dab all the time. And I have patients who I've seen who dab 20 times a day, uh, and that's ridiculous. Uh, they've lost the response. And, and then when they try to get off, they're having withdrawal effects. So we counsel all our patients about appropriate use, and dabbing is rarely appropriate. Intraoral is excellent for inexperienced users. So you use a sublingual pump, or, or most of them come in tincture bottles, and you can count the drops, you can put so much in, you can easily uh, adjust your dose when you're using tinctures. And I really like tinctures for our elders or for people who are inexperienced. A lot of our patients will come in and the first thing they'll say is, I want to get high, and then we start with CBD only. And then if they need THC, we'll add it in. And they'll usually have a conversation with one of our nurses down the road who can make recommendations to them. Um, Transdermal patches, uh, they will usually go on the dorsal part of the wrist or ankle and they can get absorbed and you can put a patch on before bed if you're using a CBN patch or a certain type of THC that will help you sleep, take it off in the morning uh, when you get up. Uh, so they can be pretty effective for some people, not everybody absorbs adequately and some people have a local reaction from it. They can be expensive and that's a downside but they are convenient and they are dis discreet. Ingestibles, uh, this has become very, very common here in Colorado uh, because there's so many uh, edible forms, capsules, tablets, you name it. Start low and go slow. There are four times, four, I should say four to 10 times stronger and, uh, and about four times longer acting than say inhalation. So when you ingest something, you gotta be very careful. Things are, uh, you're changing in your liver, uh, delta 9 THC, which is what we're getting in all the other methods, it converts to 11 hydroxy THC in the liver uh, through your cyclone P450 system. And what ends up happening is that you could have a much stronger, longer effect, and it could be really unpleasant. So you have to be very careful when you're recommending ingestible forms to people. I, I usually recommend them more at night for sleep, if you're sleeping through the night. I don't like to recommend them during the day unless you're used to using them and you know what you're doing and how to dose yourself and you're not getting out in your car and driving somewhere. Um, but they're inconsistent and the reason they're inconsistent is because there could be issues with your uh, CYP450 system in the liver, there could be uh, leaky gut or intestinal hyperpermeability or whatever you want to call it uh, where you're not absorbing things adequately in your small intestine. So there's a lot of variability in what people will, uh, uh, how they'll respond to adjustable. So you gotta go slow, uh, or, or start low and go slow when you're using those. And there, are, uh, if you have fatty foods with it, there'll be higher absorption. So I mentioned good for sleep, start with two and a half to five milligrams. Dabbers that I see need 100 milligrams of more to have any effect. And that's because their receptors are not responding. Um, so this is juicing other methods. You can juice the leaves and get the acid forms. You can use rectal suppositories uh, have worked for a lot of people now. Um, and there are particular situations where we may recommend it, such as prostate or colorectal cancer to get a more of a localized effect. Vaginal applica applications are available as well. Um, and I won't get into that too much. All right, I want to get into pain and addiction. Uh, and I wanted to segue into the next talk. I added these slides at the last minute uh, during the week. And I'm gonna state very clearly, cannabis is, the, is an ideal medication to help patients who want to wean off of narcotics, benzos, and alcohol, which all kill people, especially in combination. Cannabis 
can help you get off and wean off these drugs. And it works in three ways. Um, number one, it uh, prevents a glutamated cytotoxicity in the brain, which kills brain cells, which happens when people are weaning off these uh, three things that I mentioned. Um, and um, it also uh, helps reduce the need. So if you're treating pain and you can treat it with cannabinoids, you can immediately lower your dose of opioids. As a matter of fact, we found that most people who use cannabinoids with opioids can almost uh, cut their dose in half uh, because it's going to potentiate the effects of the opioids. So you don't need as much, and then you're less likely to die. Um, so that's something that's very, very important um, to, to realize. So narcotics, especially when combined with benzos and alcohol, is a leading cause of death in the United States. Overdose deaths have declined in, in, by 25%. This is out of JAMA uh, in states that had medical marijuana available to patients. So both opioid and cannabinoid receptors are present in brain signaling regions of, uh, it, or, of the signaling regions in the brain and spinal cord. Opioids and cannabinoid signaling pathways interact with each other, and administration of cannabinoids with opioids results in greater and additive anti pain effect. This is one of the most important things we're doing in our practice right now, is helping people get off the of focus. Uh, symptoms of withdrawal are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, muscle spasm, anxiety, agitation, restlessness, insomnia, runny nose, sweating. Well, guess what? You can use one plant medicine that's non-toxic to treat all the symptoms of withdrawals. So it reduces the need, it decreases withdrawal effects, and it protects the brain. It's the perfect exit drug. I'm not going to get into this. Uh, I mentioned glutamate cytotoxicity already, uh, so I won't go there. And I guess we're going to be doing questions. <laughs>